Vaughn Bryant, a professor of anthropology at Texas A&M University, was awarded a PhD in botany from the University of Texas at Austin in 1969. One research specialty he has pioneered over the course of more than 30 years plus centers on the pollen analysis of commercial honey from around the world. His intent to verify both the country of origin and the primary nectar sources of the honey on the world markets. Among his customers are beekeepers who send samples for analysis to allow for accurate labeling of their honey products. The first thing I like to do when I get a sample from a person, immediately I begin thinking that if I'm going to look at this, I'm going to run into pollen types that would be diagnostic of, let's say, North Texas. Right? Sure enough, when I started looking at it, most of the pollen types in there would be types that I would expect to find in that area of Texas, uh, basically because of the ecology of the region and so forth. Now occasionally in honey samples we also find a few pollen grains from basically plants that don't really have nectar, uh, such things as oak for example. Sometimes we find a little pollen from walnut or pecan or something like that. And some of those could be accidental in the sense they could blow into the hive and this actually get mixed in with the nectar that they're being uh, made in the honey. Or in some cases when they're actually collecting nectar from some flowers, they actually pick up a couple of extra pollen types that uh, blew into that flower and got trapped on the bee. Or very often, another thing that happens is a bee may travel from one particular plant to another one, a different plant, and he's picking up pollen from both different types. So there's a number of different ways to look at it. I thought this was humorous. Uh, we were looking at some uh, honey samples from East Texas one time and we're finding very low concentration values. And we knew that there was nothing funny. The guy said he hadn't been feeding his bees sugar water and he didn't know why there was so few pollen grains. It turned out the bees were foraging on uh, open soda cans at a nearby roadside park. And so their primary source of nectar, so po supposedly, was coming from the sugar in uh, soda cans. They found that it was a lot easier to collect that than to go dig around in flowers. So, well, of course, honey is a combination of a lot of stuff. Uh, the nectar from each individual plant is going to be a little bit different. Uh, they're going to contain different sugars. They're going to contain different uh, other materials. Uh, we call them flavonoids if you want them, things that add flavor to it and so forth. I taste a lot of the honey that I process, and yeah, there's a lot of differences, but I don't think I could close my eyes and tell you which is which. If you're going to do pollen studies of any major type, you've got to have a good database. And the big problem with pollen, as I said earlier, there's at least 250,000 different types of flowers. Each one has a very specific type of uh, pollen to it. So it makes it very difficult for you to know all of these. And so uh, essentially what you have to have is a, it's like a library. And, and uh, there are several ways to do this. We have a big slide collection, about 20,000 slides of pollen types from different areas of the world. So yes, it's, uh, it's, it's a long learning curve. And one of the reasons there's so few people to do this is because of the tremendous amount of effort and work and training you'd have to do. I get people all the time amateurs like yourself who write in and want to know, well, we would like to find out what the bees are you know, using and we want to do some pollen studies and I try to explain them the, the problems of all of this and I rarely hear from them again and it's not that I'm trying to discourage people, it's just that it's a, a rather difficult type of thing to do. You, it's not you can't do it, but it just takes a lot of training and time. So anyway, I, I probably have looked at more than Man, at least 2,000, maybe more, mm -hmm. different honey samples just from the United States. Wow. And I also look at a lot of honey samples from other countries as well. So essentially what we would do is we would get a sample of honey like this from somebody who sends it to us, either a beekeeper or somebody who's in the commercial business. The first thing we have to do is to weigh out 10 grams. So what I try to do here is by watching this and trying to see how close I can get, it's a little over. Now, I usually use a stick in order to remove a little bit to see if I get right down to 10 grams. And you can see I'm right at nine, that's close enough for government work, 9.99. I don't think I can get much closer than that. So the next step is you take the honey and you, you get a, you have to get a stir rod, okay? And honey will not mix with, honey will not mix with uh, alcohol. It only, it mixes with water. On the other hand, if you use water and honey, 
The problem is that you have to get the viscosity down and the specific gravity down enough to where all the honey is going to sink in the centrifuge tube. So one of the things that we have experimented with, in fact we've published papers on this, is what we call the ETOH or the alcohol processing technique, which basically says the first thing you do is add about 20 milliliters, and we have it on the scale here, you see. We add about 20 milliliters of water, and then we stir it very well. Make sure that the honey is all dissolved in the water. Okay, it looks like it's pretty well dissolved. The next step, is to add our tracer spores. And the reason we add tracer spores is for two important reasons. The first reason is, these are tracer spores here. We have to purchase these. Only one place in the world makes these, and it's in Sweden. And they cost about 50 cents a piece. But we will sacrifice one to show you. All right, so this contains 18,583 spores of the plant called lycopodium. It's a little lycopod. No bee has ever collected lycopods, so we know that this did not come from the honey. Now, this is in a calcium base, so we have to digest it with hydrochloric acid. And so we use 15% hydrochloric acid and put a little bit in there, and you can see it bubbling. Okay? And so then we have to wait until it completely dissolves and then add it to the honey. All right. So it takes a little bit time. All right, so the next thing we're going to do is then add the lycopodium spores to the honey, OK? And I always rinse it out with alcohol to make sure that we are going to get all of the spores so that none of these are going to be lost. The next step is something which I like to do. And that is that I add a stain to it called nigrosin. And the reason it doesn't have any effect whatsoever on the, on the honey or the sample, but by adding this, what happens is the transparent pollen, which normally you can't see because it's transparent, will now get stained black. And so at the bottom of the test tube, it's going to look something like that. By adding the stain, you'll be able to see it at the bottom of the test tube, like this. In other words, if it were transparent, you might not see it. Okay. So, the next step is then we take alcohol, right here, you see, 95% ETOH, and we add it up to, we add 100 milliliters of this to this so that it brings it up to a total of about 120 total milliliters. So now what we have is a mixture of honey and water and alcohol. And then we very carefully will pour this into the centrifuge tubes. We will then centrifuge these down and we let it run. Well, I got a clock over here. We let it run for a couple minutes. If you, if you can see here, there's a little bit in the bottom. Do you see that little bit there? And this is the thing. There's just not a whole lot of pollen in honey, so you have to be real careful. So we pour these out again and repeat the process. Okay. And what we're going to do now is to combine all of these. So I put a little bit in that and vortex it. You got it? So, but you can see here, uh, that this takes, t you know, this is why when you charge 50 bucks for a sample, you're getting you get a good deal. So if you look here, you can see there's a little bit in the bottom, you see, but not much. So now we've got it all down into one tube and we fill that up with alcohol. And then we have to use a dummy to balance it. And so now we will balance them and put them in here and spin them down. And then we'll show you the dangerous step. And you can see here, this is the total that we got out of that whole sample. You see, 10 grams. You see, if we didn't stain it to begin with, it's so transparent you wouldn't even know you had anything in the bottom because it would all look like water. Now, the next step is very critical. Glacial acetic acid, the, it's, it's a super vinegar, as I call it, because it smells just like vinegar, but it is 
super vinegar. So we have to use glacial acetic acid in order to get the water out. And if you have water in it, it will go like a Roman candle. It'll just whoop. I don't want to show you. I don't want to show you. Anyway, so now we've got our sample and it's been thoroughly washed in, so it's thoroughly washed in glacial acetic acid, all right? And I'm going to pour this out under the fume hood because it stinks. The nice part about this next step is that if you screw up and it explodes in your face, you would be blind for life. There is absolutely nothing they can do for you. If you get this stuff in your eye, you're blind. The ratio is nine parts acetic anhydride to one part sulfuric acid. All right. Now both of these by themselves are fairly harmless. You put them together and you got a really good mixture. All right. Several things happen. First of all, it changes color. The second thing is if you feel it, it's very hot. All right. The third thing is when you put anything that's made of cellulose in it, it will, not only that, but it will turn the stick black. You see the stick? And what it's doing is it's eating up the cellulose, which is the function of this. What you're trying to do is to put this in with the pollen to eat up the cellulose, but you want to get rid of all of the other stuff, the cytoplasm and everything on the inside and outside, so that you can see the pollen grains effectively. That's why we do this, okay? So the next step then is to very carefully get rid of the stick here and very carefully pour this into this mixture. Okay. So here's your sample. The next thing we do is heat it in here for 10 minutes. And then after we heat it for 10 minutes, we take it out, we put in the glacial acetic acid again spin it down, and then wash it with water, and then eventually it's ready to be mounted in glycerin to examine. And that's the whole process.